Not for you, actually. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. <laughs> it's an awesome day. Yes. Kind of hot, a little bit hot, maybe, but not too bad, I guess. Uh, welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're watching online, please say hi so we know that you're with us here this morning. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, we got a lot of fun things coming up again. We've got uh, this whole new movie series, which I think is great. But, uh, we have our sermon series that we're in the middle of right now. We just started up season two. So this will be episode two of season two we're going to talk about today. And uh, so we have that on Sunday morning. And then on Wednesday, we show the full episode and, and have some really nice discussion time. I really appreciate that discussion time on Wednesday nights. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, so this Wednesday at 7 p.m., we'll continue on with the series in here and of The Chosen, and it is going to be out, uh, We Are Chosen to See God, which is the name of today's message. Orange Track Racing, then, continues on, uh, let's see, that's going to be September 9th already, and so uh, registration at 9.30 and racing starts at 10, and that's an awesome time as well, and then... September 2nd, we have the men's breakfast coming through. Uh, so that's going to be fun. We're going to have everything back in. Denny's going to be here. So, we'll, yeah. of course, we'll have biscuits and gravy <laughs> and uh, all the rest of the fixings that go along with that. And then later that night, as soon as we get done with the men's breakfast in the morning, we have movie night, The Chronicles of Narnia. So it's the first in the series of three movies that we're going to be showing in here, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And again, everything is free. Uh, Come on in, the gates open up at five o'clock and the movie starts at six. So it should be a really, really great time. We're really looking forward to this. This is, this is a really neat series of movies. If you haven't seen all, all three of these, uh, you really need to see them because it, it, you don't get the full story until you go all the way to the end. So it's, it's kind of fun that way. But then again, I think that's the way the Bible goes too, right? So uh, welcome and, and let's start our time off with the word of prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this time together. We thank you for the many blessings you give us each and every day. We thank you for this bright and sunny day that we have out here. And Lord, for the blessings that come along with that. Uh, we know that in you and, and through you, Lord, you uh, choose to bless us and keep us and make us strong through you. And Father God, we ask that you would come into this day and into this very space where we know that wherever two or more are gathered into your name, there you are amongst us, and we just praise you and thank you for that. So, Lord, we just ask today that you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to receive your message into us, and for us to live that message out day by day, the message in both the word and in the music today. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our call to worship today is 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And it talks about us being a chosen people. And uh, in this here, I used a Burian translation today. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what he's talking about here, when, when Peter was talking about this, he was given that message out of hope and that you have a future and God has chosen you. You are a chosen people. And we are chosen to see God in all of the world that he has created for us. And so as we go through this call to worship this morning, the, the believers are the chosen people, those who listened and heed the word of God, the word of Jesus. And they are the chosen people of God in Christ, fulfilling their role that was originally given Israel. So we had a couple of different things that we can look at in here. Uh, back in the Old Testament, when we think about it, we go back into Exodus 19. And it talks about Israel being a chosen nation amongst the people. And all of the world... Israel was the chosen nation. And <laughs> stereo. <laughs> Delayed stereo, but I love it. Uh, but under the new covenant of Christ's blood, 
The church is the chosen people serving as priests to lead those in darkness to the light of salvation. That's, that's coming through my ears here. So, yeah. To the light of salvation. Okay, that really messes you up. I guess. <laughs> takes me back to my radio days when you're broadcasting on the air and you're hearing your voice come through wow. the speakers. And going through. So, so what that brings us to then is a holy living and mission to the world marks us as God's chosen people. And we are then to lead those in darkness to the light of salvation in Christ. Holy living and that mission to the world, mark the church as God's elect in which discipleship is the core to a new priesthood. So we have to think about that. Under the, under the Old Testament, you had the high priests and the prophets and everybody. They were the only ones who were allowed to go into the inner sanctum and actually commune with God, to talk to God, to be in the presence of God. But see, under the new covenant through Christ, when he died for us on the cross, that brought us the new covenant through his blood shed for us into making us a priesthood, a royal priesthood. And that's what Peter is talking about in here, that we are that royal priesthood now. We don't have to have priests or anyone else intervene or intercess on our behalf. Intercessory means they go before God on our behalf. So... That broke us down, and we have that right relationship restored with God through Christ. And so we can call on the name of the God ourselves and be in his presence. So under the first covenant, God promised Moses that his covenant people of Israel would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And that's in Exodus 19.6. And that promise is fulfilled in the New Testament then by the church. The body of Christ, not the buildings. Don't get that confused. So, by the church. So, the church then becomes the ideal Israel. The disciples of Christ are that royal priesthood and a holy nation, as it says in there, in Peter. And the priest's responsibility is to represent God. So, when we represent being a Christian, we are representing God and Christ to others. So we represent God before the world and the world before God. So it's kind of a nice reversal of roles, but that brings us into a closer relationship then with God. See, the priests present offerings and sacrifices to God under the old covenant, and priests teach the people of God's way of life for them. Priests deal with the sin problem for God's people by bringing the sacrifices that they had to make under the Old Testament laws. But under the New Testament, Christ was the sacrifice once and for all. No more sacrifices had to be made because he was the sacrifice. We then present ourselves to God through Christ, sinless. So ancient Israel had the professional class of priests waiting for the day that the whole nation then would assume those priestly duties. And as the song goes, then Christ came, right? Mm -hmm. Then Christ came, and he took that upon himself, and we became that royal priesthood. Each believer then inherited that priestly duties, and in doing so became responsible to go to God directly to confess and receive that forgiveness for sin through Christ Jesus. So, and in doing so, then, we are able to live a holy life representing that holy God before that sinful world. As believers, we give praise in God through our words and interactions and offering spiritual sacrifices since animal sacrifices now are no longer necessary through Christ. So we, we come to God in prayer. We come to God and give our sacrifice of our sins to God in prayer. That's how we, we talk to them. Through Christ, the church has become the Israel of God, each member fulfilling that priestly role. And in this priestly role, the individual is to maintain <coughs> ties to a proper body, meaning you have a body of believers, the church. And in that role, then, we need to 
present ourselves and keep ourselves tied to that body of believers. That helps us keep in accountability with God. Okay. So we work within the church to find God's will individually and as a church body together. So we're all in this together. Um, we work with the church to carry out God's will in the world. We have outreach that we do, like our orange track racing and our movie ministries and those things. We reach out to the world to try and bring a different light and a different view to the world and dispel that darkness. So we work for the church and not against the church. And this is where a lot of people kind of get confused. We work in, in the church to find God's will individually and as a church as a whole together, the body of believers. This means we don't seek to force our will upon the church, nor do we rebel when the church discerns God's will differently than we do. We learn to cooperate together even in our differences. And we are chosen to see God in all we do then as believers. God reveals his word to us as we grow into the understanding of the nature of God. Now, this was the call to worship. This wasn't the sermon. Surprise, surprise. I told you to get two today. But in this, we are called to be that royal priesthood. And in doing so, then we are able to see God in action throughout our world. And so as we come through that today, I want you to think about that, that we are chosen to see God. And we'll give you some examples of that. But let's, uh, let's open this with a word of prayer as we go into our time of our message this morning. Gracious Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts to understand the message that you are giving to us here today. Uh, it's a lot to take in, but it, it is our opportunities. We need to be able to see you in the opportunities that you place before us. Sometimes they're in the midst of trials and tribulations, and it's a time for us to be called back into your presence. If we start to slip away, Lord, you, you give us a trial, you give us a test, and you put us through some things that may not be pleasant at the time, but it brings you closer into our lives as we rely upon you to get us through those situations. And we just praise you and thank you for that today. So open our ears to hear this message today, Lord, and to receive it into our hearts and to live it out each day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So... So, in episode two here, we're going to see uh, everyone is going to be called for reason. As if we remember back into uh, season one, and we watched as he was calling different peoples from different ways of life, everyone has been called for reason for a purpose, and in that he says, and everyone deserves to be heard. So if you notice, there was some of those people who were, who were calling out and saying, hey, you know, you need to have somebody who needs to be in charge here. And, of course, that was going to be him. That was Simon Peter. And, you know, he says, you know, these other guys, they're, they're just making a lot of noise. And they're making waves. And, you know, I don't quite agree what's been, what's being said here. So you need to put me in charge. And, and that's what Jesus says. Everyone here has been called for reason and for a purpose. And everyone deserves to be heard. And so, as we are as a church body, we need to understand that as we gather together in here, we all have a voice because we all are the church. We are the body of Christ represented to the world. And so, regardless of our lineage, um, we have to notice that Jesus didn't say this was only for the Jews and, and that's it because he came to break down those barriers. He came to give a message of hope and of good news to the entire world, not just to this class of people over here. So everyone deserves to be heard. And that says everyone, regardless of their lineage, regardless of their past deeds, regardless of the color of their skin, he called everyone. And he called us to be, in Greek, the word is nachos, is what is used here. Paul uses the word nachos. And in Greek, that means saints or holy people. So we are called to be the holy people of Christ, representing God to the world. And so it's kind of an awesome responsibility for us to have because we need to represent Christ to the world. Now, as they know, 
that, that old saying says, pictures talk louder than words. And our actions speak louder than a picture could ever do. So as we represent Christ to the world, as they watch us, we are representing them, Christ, to them. And the neat thing is that we all have different gifts that God created us with uh, to do his will in our lives. God has a plan for all of his children, for every one of us in here. He's made us to be a unique masterpiece. I want you to hold on to that. You're created to be a unique masterpiece. So have you ever considered yourself to be a masterpiece? We're going, oh man, I see all my blemishes. I see all my scars. I see all my faults. I see all my sins. I can't be a masterpiece. But guess what? God doesn't create junk. He created you to be a unique masterpiece unto yourself. Unto yourself. Look around the world that you created. Because, as I say, God doesn't make junk. Give God thanks and be thankful that he created you. Be thankful for your heart, for your talents, for your body. The more you build on that relationship with your Lord God who created you, you will truly see how awesome he created you. But see, we have to open ourselves up to look for those things, to see God in the midst of your life. Okay? So, I wanted to say again, that we are created to be unique. And that means we shouldn't look at the talents that we have and compare them to what God gave Deb or what God gave Denise or Lori or anyone else. God created us to be unique because he has a plan for us individually in our lives and corporately through the body of the church. Okay? If we all had the same gifts, we would no longer be unique. You got to think about it that way. A lot of people go through life and they're trying to live somebody else's life or they're so jealous about the gifts and talents that God gave them. Why'd you leave me out? Well, he's got a different plan for you and you've got talents that that other person doesn't have. So you need to look at yourself and see that you are a unique masterpiece that God created. You need to be blessed with what God has given you. God has also given you a purpose in life, and you were created to do good things for the Lord. And I heard one of them this morning, I didn't even know about, that you had blessed, when they were going through some rough times, you had blessed them. You had the ability, God gave you the ability, to be able to bless another person. And in so doing, you were blessed. So how many people go through life with an idea, without any idea whatsoever, that they have a real purpose for their life. And then they just end up lost in the process because they can't see it. They can't see that God created them uniquely and that he has a purpose for their life. Or they haven't opened up their heart to God for him to be able to show them that purpose that he has for their life. Then they just end up lost. That's, that's tough. We as Christians, because we are faithful to God, we can rejoice in the Lord, that you were created for his purpose. Remember that God always knows what he's doing, and never let the world make you lose sight of that. That's really important, because we get caught up in the junk of the world, and we lose sight of what God has created us to be and to do in our lives. We always have to keep focused on God, and then guess what? He'll show us the path. He'll show us the way. Psalm 139 tells us, you are priceless, fearfully and wonderfully made. God shaped and modeled you in your mother's womb. God created you in his own image. So what does this tell us? It tells us that you were created, you were redeemed, and you are deeply loved and valued by God. Let me say that again. You were created, redeemed, and are deeply loved and valued by God. How many of us, how many of us lose sight of the fact that we're redeemed, that we're valued by God? A lot of the people who struggle through life and, and the most of the people who commit suicide do so because they can't see the value in their life. They're struggling. They've lost track of God in their life or they never had God to start with. 
So we have the unique ability then to represent God to these people before it's too late. They, they don't feel valued. They feel that like there's nothing left in their life, so they end it. But see, they were uniquely created. They were redeemed, and they were deeply loved and valued by God. When we look at the disciples, he called them from various walks of life. And I believe he did so, so he would see that everyone is called. So they came from different walks of life. They're different lineages in the mix. Multi-dimensional, if you will. And one dimensional is this, is God calling us to be set apart by God for a relation with God, for participation in his kingdom work. And that's representing him to a broken world. To use traditional biblical language, we are called to be saints. That's what it means to be that nagios, that holy people in the Greek. That was what the words were when they actually wrote it down. We're called to be that saint. We're called to be that holy person to represent God to the world. God has called us to be his special people, not because of our merit. We don't do that on anything that we have earned or because we're such great people. It's because God called us into that and he has blessed us with his sovereign grace in spite of our of our scars in spite of our sins in spite of all the things we do wrong in our life god calls us to be his sovereign people because of his sovereign grace that overarching grace that washes away the sins of the world our next verse i want you to look at is one that I've been kind of talking on here is in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth. For all of the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. And this is the message that God gave to Moses up on the mount. He was telling them that, hey, I have set you apart from all of the junk in the world, from all of the rest of the people in the world, for those who are living in darkness. I have set you apart to be a royal priesthood, a holy believer, and a special treasure amongst all the peoples of the earth. And it was because God chose Israel to, to be those chosen people that we inherit through Christ. The earth's lands would be for God a priestly kingdom, and a holy nation. Though some of the people would have uncommon holy roles as priests, all of God's people were set apart for God and his purposes. In this sense, all of them were holy, or if you prefer, all of them were saints. We see this echoed in the scriptures of the New Testament when Paul uses that same term, nachios, that Greek, for saints and the holy people. That was true of Israel and it became true for all believers in and through Jesus, according to Paul. They were called to be saints, is what he says. That means we were called then to be that holy people through Christ. A better rendering in today's English would be, we're called to be God's special people. All Christians are set apart by God for God and for his purposes. This is just true of preachers, teachers, carpenters, realtors, as it is of missionaries or priests or pastors or anyone else who preaches the word of God. See, to be a saint is like, I, I like it because they had this thing on TV when I was writing this, and they were showing these Olympians in there, and they were, they were showing how fantastic they were, how hard they were to be as good as they are in that given sport that God had blessed them with. They were set apart for the rest of humanity for a particular purpose. Now let's face it, common everyday people like us just can't compete on that level as an Olympian. I can't imagine myself trying to go out and run one of those races. I might be able to walk it. I probably set a brand new world record time for the longest time it took to compete the event. But, but see, God enables us to do uncommon things when he calls us into service for him. He gave me a different talent. He gave me a different calling for my life than he gave them. See, they're a unique person. They're a unique masterpiece. 
I have a unique masterpiece to be called by God to do something different. And if we don't lose sight of that, then we are able to see then those things that God has for us in our lives. And you've heard us say it before that God enables the called. He gives us that ability and confidence to do the things we wouldn't do on our own. That is why we are called to run the good race and fight the good fight for Christ, which leads us to the good works. Another dimension that I want to talk to you about today is doing good works in God's name. Now, as the scriptures tell us, good works alone will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. But by doing the will of God, we will naturally be drawn then to do those good works that God has for us in his life. And see, the thing about it is, the neat thing, the way God works, we usually don't know it that we're doing the good works. Because we might be going along and, and just kind of doing our own thing, and yet we're blessing somebody else by the works of our hands. We kind of saw that in, in the clip from last week when we were taking a look at that, and they were plowing that entire field out there, and they go, well, oh. and he says, well, this is for what? Generations to come. We're planting the seeds for generations to come. We may never see the fruits of our handiwork that we do in God's name in our lifetime, but we've planted seeds that will then be used for generations to come. Sometimes we fail to see the purpose in our lives because we're looking on too small a scale. We have to look for that big plan that God is, is working in our lives. So when we see the disciples gathering wood and leaving it for the next travelers that come along the way, paying it forward may have started there. So a couple years back we showed that movie, Pay It Forward. And if you haven't seen it, maybe well, it's time for us to show you. See, good works don't necessarily have to be great deeds. They have to be good works. But it may be just the small things that help another along the path in their life and that we are called then to do the same. Be good Samaritans, if you will, changing us incrementally out of the worldview and into a godly view of the world. It's a whole different ballgame when you look at it that way. We see how Jesus is slowly molding those disciples into the apostles changing their norms and changing their behaviors to model his in the process. So as we go through this whole series on the chosen, I want you to look for those things where he is incrementally changing those disciples, those followers, to be just from being just normal people out there to making a difference in the world, changing them to be a model of Jesus. And he's calling us to do the same. So I'd like you to think back on how you may have been changed since you became a believer. Are you still that same person that you were before you accepted Christ in your life? Not a chance. I'm nowhere near it. I'm not that same person. I died to that person. That person is no longer here. I still have the same name. Unfortunately, I still have the same body. But I'm not the same person because I am allowing Christ to work in me and through me to change me incrementally. Notice I keep saying incrementally, small changes that happen over a period of time to make a large change in our lives. We see this evidenced in John 1 as we read how the disciples were called and how they were changed by them meeting Jesus and following Jesus. So. If you go to your Bibles in here, it's going to call it the first disciples. John 1, 35 through 51. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John showed him at him and John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following him. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained. They remained with him for the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John had said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Christ which means the Messiah, the Savior. 
That's what Christ Jesus means. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth? exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Peter replied. As he approached Pete, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. He said, How do you know about me, Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under a fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you? I had seen you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than this. And then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and coming down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. And in this passage here, we can see Jesus saying, come and see. I've got those stickers on the back table. Come and see. And if you didn't notice, he didn't tell them what they were going to do. He only told them to follow. See, and they had to step out of their lives. They had to take that step of faith to follow Jesus. They took the first step to becoming what God had created them to be. But they had to take that first step. And he didn't command them to come. He said, come and follow me. He invited them to come along. They had to accept the invitation, just as we have to accept God's invitation. We see Nathaniel under the fig tree having an enormous pity party when we look at the scenes in there. No one has trouble but you. Ever been there? Who has a pity party? Come on in. The water's deep. The water's fine. You're going to drown in it if you're not careful. See, we're so blinded by our current circumstances that we discount God in the process and we cry out against God with our misplaced anger and frustration. And that's what Nathaniel was doing. God, you created me. I followed you. I did all these things for you. And that building collapsed on itself. And I completely lost everything. See, he was blinded by the circumstance. But if all that stuff hadn't happened, he wouldn't have been sitting under that tree and then when he met Jesus, Jesus said, I saw you sitting under the tree. And then he believed. See, those bad things that happened to Nathaniel in his life were all part of God's plan to get him to someplace better. And he came out much, much, much better in the process. Nathaniel cried out, do you see me? Do you see me? And things that God abandoned him. When we cry out in our pain and our misery and in our suffering and, and we're looking at our circumstances and we can't figure that it's going to get any lower, do we cry out to God, do you see me? Why are you doing this to me? Why, God? Why do you let bad things happen to good people? Well, God does see us. God does hear us. He hears us call out to him, and God is with us. He is waiting for us to call out for him in our time of need so that he can come into our lives and rescue. That's opening the door. He can't work through a closed door. We have to open that door and let God in. We have to let him into our circumstance. And as we see in the scripture, John tells Nathaniel, I saw, or Jesus tells Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree, and he believed. And he said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. It took that revelation. It took that building collapse. It took all those things to make the change in his life to see God in the midst of his life. And that's what it takes for us at times. We're so caught up in the circumstances, we miss the fact that God is calling out to us to open that door, to receive God into our presence. 
We see clearly when we come into the presence of God, when we invite God into our circumstances, it changes things. See, that circumstance, it might not change, but we do. And that's the key. That's the good news. The circumstance may not change, but God will change us in the process of that circumstance. This is what being called will do. It changes us from the inside out. Our circumstance that brought us to the point of despair still exists, but our perspective on what really matters has changed. And we look at our life differently as a result. The difficulty was necessary so we could fully rely on God and not on ourselves. And that's what brought us to God. We couldn't do it anymore under our own power. We finally had that realization. Right where we needed to be. God had us right there. Right where he wanted us to be. Underneath that fig tree. So that when we came into that realization. That revelation of God before us. When we opened that door. Do you see me? And then God is able to answer. This multi-dimensional understanding is necessary for us. To understand the very nature of God. God doesn't work like we work. God works supernaturally. To understand God is greater than any circumstances in our life. It is key to allowing God into our lives. God reaches out to us through our failures and gives us new possibilities through him. Jesus said, come and see. And they did. They opened the door. Now the passage in the Bible says, Seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Come and see. Open the doors and I'll come into your life. If we look at Matthew, and, and for those of you who don't know, Matthew translated is Yahweh's gift. That's his name. And we see him specially gifted by God. Some would say he was strange, but they didn't see how brilliant he could be. He used the gifts that God had given him to excel, and that caused him to be an outcast in the process. God gave him a special mind, a calculating mind, and something that set him apart from the rest of the people. And he was smart enough to know if I took this and applied it, then it would take care of me for my life. And that's what he was doing. Unfortunately, he was doing it as a tax collector. He was doing it as a tax collector. He was ostracized from his service. He became an outcast in the process. And yet it allowed him to interact with the very people that hated him. A tax collector. The lowest of lows. Yet God called him out of that to become an apostle. Some who, who would go on to give his very life to bring salvation to the people. The very people who hated him. Who ostracized him. Who outcast him. God used him to make those people whole. See, we fail to see in the midst of our circumstances what God is using for the good. Those seeds are planted, and it happens to work for generations to come. Anybody in here ever heard of Matthew? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. So for generations to come, those things that were planted thousands of years ago, guess what? They're still active in the world today. They're still active in our lives today. But we have to listen. We have to see God in the process. Those same people that saw God use Matthew to bring the good news to them. Matthew, in the process, gave it all away. He gave everything away to keep it. He gave everything away to keep it. He felt and saw a greater calling, a new way of understanding God and his use for his talents, and it brought it back into the graces of his family and the people in the process. He gave his riches away to get even greater rewards through Jesus Christ. He was chosen. You are chosen. Each one of us are chosen. We've got to open up that door to God to let him in. See, we are chosen too. We have to lay down our preconceived notion and open our hearts and our lives to God. The people of the world want to judge us by our past. Just like the Jews judged Matthew, people want to define us by our path, just like they did to Nathaniel. God wants to lead us into our future in spite of our past. 
I want you to hang on to that through the week, that God wants to lead us into our future despite our past. So which would you rather do? Which would you rather follow? God cannot do a work in our life unless we invite him into our lives and make room for God. Make time for God. We're all so busy in our lives that we shove God off to the side and we're trying to trudge through life and push and try and figure out how to make it through the next day, through the next week, through the next month. Had we just simply taken and made time for God and spent time for God, he would go, oh, I've got the path already set for you. I have your purpose in life. Let me allow you to give you the blessings and the gifts that I have in store for you. But you've got to rely on me. You've got to make room for me. You've got to make time for me. How much time do you give God? An hour a week? Two hours a week? How much of your life do you give to God? See, your future is your choice, literally. Your future is your choice. You can choose to make time for God. You can choose to live your life for God. Or you can choose the worldly trudge through life itself. Choose well. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I come before you just as I am. And I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of my sins. Please forgive me. In your holy name, I forgive all of others for what they've ever done against me. I renounce that. I let go of it. Please release me from it. I renounce Satan and the evil spirits and all of their works. I give you my entire self, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord, my God, and my Savior. Heal me, change me, strengthen me in body, soul, and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, cover me with your precious blood and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Anoint me and anoint me to be your disciple. I love you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I promise I will follow you every day of my life. In your holy and precious name I pray today. Amen. <laughs> well, as we come into this time of, of communion this morning, it's kind of fun when you, when you do it all on one Sunday. <laughs> I miss you, Terry. <laughs> but as we come into the time of communion today, it's time for us to commune together. Uh, so that means we are joining together in remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. We come into communion time in here to sacrifice ourselves. We're putting ourselves up on that cross. We're dying to our old lives. We're dying to our old self. And in doing so, we open the door for God to come into our lives. By his blood, we are cleansed. By his body, we are made new again. On the night that Jesus was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later in the meal, he took the cup and after he had filled it, he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Scripture further goes on to say that he will not again drink the fruit of the vine until he returns again in glory and in the victory. And we just wait for that day to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In the midst of our problems today, come, Lord Jesus, come. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take Amen. and drink. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, come into our hearts today and make us anew in you. Lord, give us the strength. Enable our minds to pursue you. Open our door to you, Lord. Come in and make us anew in you. Lord, show us the possibilities in our lives. Show us the blessings that are staying in wait for us to open ourselves up to you. Lord, we just open our minds and our hearts today to receive you in. 
we open our doors of our lives to you to allow you to come in and make us new, to give us new life, to re be reborn spiritually. Lord, we look forward to the day when we can again join with you and we will receive new bodies, new minds, and new spirits in you. And we shall never die to spirit, even though we should die to body. Lord, because we will be lifted up with you in heaven. Thanks be to God. for the people. If anyone's got uh, someone they'd like to pray for, we're going to lift up Joe this morning for his surgery. And... Okay. Well, first of all, I want to pray for Terry and Diane, and I pray that God gives them um, strength and courage wherever they're at and um, safe travels. And uh, Father God, we come to you this morning. We honor you and praise your holy name. For without you, we are just dust in your hand. But with you, we can do all things. For Isaiah states in 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Father God, as I pray for others, bring the Holy Spirit into this place. Let it rest on all of us so that we feel your presence among us. Help us to do your will and not our own, Lord Jesus. For with you all things are possible. Without you in our lives, we are like waves tossed by the wind. Be with us, comfort us, hold on to us, Lord, and never let us go, Jesus. Father, I lift up our church family. We are all struggling in some form or another, whether it be surgery, illness, disease, family issues that tear at our heart, children that have lost their way, grandchildren that have turned their hearts to the world and do not want to follow you. O oh Lord my God, make a way for them to find you and know your mighty power, your love and your hope. I pray for healing and comfort for Joe who had knee surgery this week. I thank you Lord for his life and thank you that all things went well for him. I pray you will heal him and comfort him as each new day appears. Strengthen him, O oh Lord, my God. Strengthen Amanda and Kelly, that their kidneys heal, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Father God, I pray for California and the neighboring states as, our, as your Hurricane Hillary hits land. I pray for mercy on the people in its path. For in your word it says to show grace and mercy to others. I pray you will that I, I pray that you will do that for these people. I pray your will. I pray you will less, lessen the winds and the rain and the devastation it will bring, Lord Jesus. Father God, I thank you for your creation that you have placed us in for such a time as this. You are God, there is no other. Let people praise your holy name first and above all things. For by your breath we were created to honor and worship you all the days of our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for all things. May you be praised throughout the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that, Denise. I echo that that concern for the people in California. We were able to talk to my youngest son last night who lives in Los Angeles and his apartment is less than a mile. Oh, <laughs> oh no. So he's kind of great. So <clears throat> we pray his protection and buried protection yes. around that whole area yes. there, Lord. Uh, we praise you and thank you, Lord. And this does bring us to the end of our online portion of our service today. Um, and we thank you for joining us. And we ask that you would uh, take a look at the music that we had today because it speaks to us in word. Um, I actually shuffled and shuffled and shuffled songs uh, as I was preparing this because they all were speaking loud. And so I took the ones that were speaking to me the loudest and that's what we're gonna hear today. So, um, so listen to the words of the songs because they are here to uplift our hearts.
Gracious Lord, we just ask a blessing on all those who are with us here today, those who couldn't be with us. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry and Diane as they are re reconnecting and they are refreshing themselves up there with some definite needed time out. We just praise you and thank you for that. Bring, up, bring them home to us safely. As we uh, prepare to go out into the world again, we just ask for your protection. We ask that we would open the doors let you into our circumstances, let you into the world, and that should dispel all of the darkness of the world, Lord. Help us to represent you to all those that we can. Dispel our fears from reaching out to others so that they would listen and that they would know the purpose for their lives. Mm -hmm. And in your holy name we pray today. Amen. 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 So, pleasure here, sincere.